At this time, we'll have the uh, reading of the Word of God, a text today from, from John chapter 17. So if you're following along, with your open your Bibles there to John chapter 17. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 20, John 17, verse 20. Let us hear God's in, inspired and inerrant word. John 17, verse 20. Our Lord prays the following words. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And may God, the Holy Spirit, who has given us this infallible word, see fit to bless this scripture. Our text today is verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, congregation, this uh, 17th chapter of the Gospel of John records what's called the high priestly prayer of Christ. And uh, like the high priest of Israel who wore 12 precious stones on his breastplate in four different rows, each gem representing a tribe of Israel, so Jesus also prays for you, his jewels. In this chapter, he does what uh, jewelers might call romancing the stone. That is, he expresses his love for you, his people. Now here Jesus is in the upper room and after preaching to his disciples, he lifts up his eyes to heaven and he prays to his father. But that's not the only thing he lifts up. He also lifts up the curtain which is over his own tender heart, his loving heart. Just as a woman's diary unlocks the secrets of her heart, so your, heart, your heartfelt prayers. And so here God allows you to eavesdrop a little bit upon the praying of Jesus Christ. Now, no doubt, uh, thinking about this prayer, the 19th century Scott Presbyterian Robert Murray McShane wrote the following. He said, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. So Christ continues to pray for his people. He continues to pray for you in the upper room, except that that room is now much more upper than the old upper room. It's in heaven itself, where Jesus has appeared before his Father in your behalf. Now, this chapter is a chapter of wonderful comfort for us. Years ago, uh, my predecessor in the church that I pastored for 27 years in Sacramento lay dying of st stomach cancer. And um, I visited him in his house. He was in hospice uh, care. And um, out of the blue, he requested that I read to him John chapter 17. In fact, uh, he was so much uh, enthralled by uh, John chapter 17 and so familiar with it that he actually recited the verses as I was reading them from the Bible. 
And a little bit later on, I found out that the great Scott ref, uh, reformer, John Knox, also requested John chapter 17 to be read when he was on his deathbed. Why John chapter 17? Well, because you see, one of, the, one of the main business pursuits of the Lord Jesus Christ is your glorification. Jesus is praying for you to be glorified. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 30 and 31, we have what's called the golden chain of salvation. Moreover, whom he predestinated, he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. And notice there, that's in the past tense. How can it be that it's in the past tense when it hadn't happened yet? Well, your glorification is so certain that God says, that Paul writes, that you have been glorified. Now, glorification is the ultimate glorification, is the resurrection of your body at Christ's second coming when you'll live in the new heavens and the new earth. So to uh, tweak, not to correct, but to tweak the Westminster Shorter Catechism, there's a sense in which we can say the chief end of God is to glorify man. The meaning of that is God is committed to your glorification, your ultimate station in heaven itself to be with Christ. Now, the responsibility of the high priest of Israel was to intercede for God's people. Scripture says that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us in Hebrews chapter 7. That is, Jesus lives for you. He died on the cross for you. But when he arose, he arose to ever live in heaven for you. Now in the first five verses, Christ prays for himself. And then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for the apostles. But now in verses 20 and following, he prays for what we call the Holy Catholic Church, meaning the church universal, you and me. So this prayer is very personal. It applies to every one of you individually. Previously, Jesus prayed for the well-being of his church in the world, the church militant, as we call it. But now in verse 24, he prays for your eternal happiness in the world to come. That is, the church triumphant. And so my uh, text today, as I said, is verse 24. Jesus prays for you to be glorified. In fact, you can realistically write your own John Hancock into this verse. If you are in Christ, if you are justified by faith alone and been adopted into his family, you will be glorified. It is absolutely certain. Now, Jesus' picture here is uh, grander than uh, the metaphorical pictures of heaven in the book of Revelation, such as pearly gates and jeweled foundation and streets of gold. The text that we have before us today, in a sense, is the crown jewel text. It anticipates the consummation of your, heaven, of your heavenly happiness in the coming intermediate heaven, and then in the final heaven, the final heaven being the new heavens and the new earth, wherein shall dwell righteousness. Now, it's always good to remember that we as Christians journey to heaven progressively in three or four stages both getting there and being there, in fact, are heavenly. First, when you uh, come to Christ for salvation, when you lay down the weapons of your warfare, your armaments against Christ, and submit to him, then your heavenly journey begins. Your affections are now fixated in heaven, and that's where your heart is as well. Why? Because Christ is seated in heaven. And so, you see, to be heavenly-minded is to be Christ-minded. As Paul wrote to the Colossians, if you then are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. So God's will for you is to look upward where his son is enthroned. And this was uh, literally true of, the, of Stephen, who's famous as the first martyr of the church. 
While in the throes of being stoned by an angry crowd, he looked up into heaven <clears throat> and he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And so while plummeled and bloodied with rocks, thrown in fierce rage and anger, he looked up to Jesus. And so this one, one of the commentators once said that the outlook was bad, but the uplook was glorious because his heart and his mind and his eyes were already there in heaven. This reminds me of a saying applied to the Puritan of whom it was said, heaven was in him before he was in heaven. And would to God that that could be true of all of us. Now the second leg of your heavenly journey is death. That's when your soul departs from your body and then uh, under a, a convoy of angels, you fly upward to Christ. So it's first your heart and then your soul soars to heaven. This is what we call the intermediate heaven, which is the heaven before God's eternal heaven, as I said, in the new heavens and the new earth. This intermediate heaven is often called the intermediate state by systematic theologians, a phrase uh, that I, I find to be very boring, frankly, the intermediate state. How about the, how about the intermediate estate? estate? At least that sounds palatial. Scripture even calls it paradise or a mansion. The great evangelist George Whitfield preached. In fact, I've even written this in my hymn book at home. Here's what Whitfield said. Death, what a comfort is that for a believer? Christ has taken away the sting of it. Henceforth, it is no longer a king of terrors, but a welcome messenger to conduct the saints to glory. Now, the third stage of your pilgrimage will be your resurrection. That's when your body and soul reunite, and then you will be in Christ's presence forever. And once again, this event is absolutely guaranteed. Paul wrote to the Romans, not only that, but we, are, uh, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the re uh, resurrection or redemption of our body. First fruits is a financial term taken from the marketplace. It's basically a down payment or earnest money. God's down payment is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the resurrection, uh, resurrected Christ. And God never fudges on any of his debts. And so when God makes a down payment, which he did when he raised up Jesus from the dead, it is guaranteed that he will pay all of the interest as well. And the interest is you. So your future is not just an opinion. And then the final leg of your journey is when uh, you will meet the Lord in the air. And then you'll be transported uh, back uh, to this earth, which will be renovated by the power of God. And you will experience the new heavens and the new earth. Now let's look a little bit more closely at this uh, 24th verse, our text. Notice, that, first of all, that Jesus prays a paternal prayer for you. He starts off, Father. Now it's true that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is also your Father, but he is not your father in the same way as he is with Jesus. Jesus is God's, uh, remember, Trinitarian son. You're an adopted son. Jesus prayed when he prayed as the natural son of God, the everlasting son of God. The focus uh, on his glory unders underscores his deity and his glorified humanity as well. But particularly in this prayer, he says, Father, I will, I will. The question here is, does the word will express authority or does it express desire, that is, the deepest desire of his heart? If it's will, then Jesus' authority is being underscored, like, you know, you would make your uh, last will in and testament. But this is really a false choice, really. Christ loving desire is blended with his authority so that there's sweetness in the willing and there is also authority 
in the sweetness. Besides, uh, when, you when you write your will, when you make out a will, you write it out affectionately, do you not? You sort of dip your pen in the inkwell of your own heart when you make out a will. And also, you would want your will to be enforced by Caesar. So we see the blending of the two here, the authority as well as the sweet desire on the part of Christ. Now, particularly, he, he intercedes for those who are given to Christ. This prayer is exclusive. We're only given uh, to, Christ, uh, to Christ as a result of God's sovereign election. In eternity, you were already given so that in, 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 that in time you'll be the fruit of Christ's vicar vicarious atonement on the cross. This is what's called glorious predestination which is a colossal emphasis in the Gospel of John, a huge emphasis. Many years ago, a friend of mine was attending college and fellowshipping with, with those of the Arminian persuasion of salvation, which is that we're saved by free will plus God's will. It wasn't long before they agreed that they would like to study the Bible together. And my friend uh, naturally suggested the book of Romans, to which his friends balked, and they said, well, we know better than to study the book of Romans with a Calvinist. Well, then my friend said, well, what would you like to study then, since I'll be the leader? And they said, why not the Gospel of John? And my friend said, that'll be no problem, no problem. Well, three times, Jesus underscores that you are given to him by the Father, in John 6, verse 37, all that the Father has given me shall come to me, and he who comes to me I will in no way cast out. And in John 6, verse 39, this is the will of him, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. You see, you cannot lose your salvation, because you see, God cannot be put in check, cannot be checkmated. You can never, as Joe J. J. Vernon McGee used to say down in Los Angeles, and that is you can never slip out of the hand of Christ because you are the hand of Christ, being members of his body. So you can know if you're elect, if you have come to Christ, because wherever there is a giving, there is also a coming. So that means that you can know if you're elect, by whether or not you are united to Christ by faith. Now here Jesus prays fervently for you to be glorified. He desires, first of all, that you be where he is. He speaks of the future location of his glorified body. So you see, heaven is geographical. It is a place. Scripture calls it a house, a heavenly house. Many years ago, uh, J.I. Packer understated it a little bit. He said that heaven is an unknown place with a known occupant. And um, I think he was trying to be humorous and funny a little bit when he said that, as reading between the lines. But heaven is not, as one has said, the beautiful isle of somewhere. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. If we keep that in front of us, that would be of great comfort for us. Or we could say that heaven is a known place with a known occupant. The occupant is Christ, and the place for us at death will be the intermediate heaven before it's relocated to the new, to the new earth, which is this earth renovated. Jesus said in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, the word there, mansions, is uh, from the William Tyndale translation, one of the great martyrs of the church, William Tyndale. And modern uh, trans translations will read rooms, perhaps that's what you have in your translation, emphasizing the roominess of heaven. And some even translate the word mansions, apartments. In my father's house 
our many apartments. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, using the word apartments doesn't sit very well <laughs> with me. Apartment living, to me, isn't, is not uh, paradise. It's, in fact, it's, in my mind, it's no better than the old tenements in New York City. Tenements in New York City, remember, they were run down, overpopulated apartment houses. And many of them are or overrun with rats as well. However, if rooms is the best translation, and I think it is, I can do something with that. I learned recently, for example, that Buckingham Palace in London has over 770 rooms. And I wouldn't mind living in Buckingham Palace. And God's house, let's remember, is palatial. It's very, very roomy. Each room is palatial. And most importantly, and as we shall shortly see, it is a room with a view. There's really something to see in this room. So I believe that it's quite demeaning for, to, call, to call Christian death uh, phrases like the grim reaper or, or, just, or just passing away. When we die, we don't just pass away. That's, that's the language basically of, uh, of the world. That cannot be, not if with, at death if you're in paradise. Even Stonewall Jackson of the of Confederate Army who was uh, shot accidentally by one of his own troopers and lay dying at, at, at Chancellorsville. He put it best, he said, knowing that he was going to die, he said, let us cross over the river and rest be beneath the shadow of the trees. And when on the cross, Jesus did not cry out, I am finished in despair, but rather, it is finished. Your redemption is finished. Those were words of victory and of conquest. You see, glorification is the consummation of your happiness. That's why in Psalm 16, verse 11, you're told, you will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. That's your right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. And this heavenly joy is underscored by a very intriguing interpretation of the words in, found in John 11 where it says that Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and it says Jesus wept. An intriguing interpretation by the fifth century Italian theologian Peter uh, Chrysologus who lived around 500 uh, AD who was a bishop in northern Italy. Now I don't, uh, I don't defend his interpretation here but I, I, I did find it to be interesting he was interpreting the words, Jesus wept. And here's what he said. He said that one reason that Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb is because he, would be, he knew that Lazarus would be re-imprisoned and resubmitted to the manifold incommodities or disadvantages of this life. He wept because Lazarus was now transferred out of the church triumphant into the church militant. You know, when we receive a member in this church, somebody from the church militant is transferred to another church militant. And at death, when we go to be with the Lord, we're transferred out of the church militant into the church triumphant. But Lazarus, he was transferred out of the church triumphant back into the church militant. And so Peter Chrysologus, he, he thought that Jesus, the reason why Jesus has wept is he was feeling sorry for Lazarus. Well, never mind that interpretation. Heaven is so magnificent that, that, Christ, uh, that, that Christ prays for you that, uh, to, uh, to be glorified here. Now notice, he desires that you be with him where he is. It's not just that Jesus wants you to be where he is. He wants your company as well. In the Old Testament, when Absalom returned to Jerusalem, he lived where David was in Jerusalem, but he wasn't with David where David was. In fact, he didn't see the face of the king for at least two years, we're told. He resided in the neighborhood of his father, but not in David's house. Well, Christ wants you not only in his neighborhood, 
but he also wants you to be in his house. And he wants you there because he wants you to behold his glory, as it says. You see, heaven is a family reunion. You'll fellowship with the family of God and its head, Jesus Christ. And certainly, you'll see your loved ones there if they've been purchased by the blood of the Savior. And certainly, you'll know one another in heaven as well. At Christ's second coming, the church is gathered, it says, together, together, in 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this fear of not knowing one another, I think, terrifies many Christians. It makes heaven almost a, a frightening place, a place of aliens, a, a, a place of strangers. And I think there are three ways that we can annihilate that idea that we, don't, we won't know one another. First in heaven, knowledge. Your knowledge will be increased. It will not be diminished, but increased. And if your knowledge is enhanced, then you'll have no problem recognizing your Christian friends. And then again, the disciples recognized even Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember, two souls that they had never, they had never laid eyes on before. And then third, just, just study Jesus after his resurrection. Let me ask you, did the disciples know Christ after his resurrection? Well, of course they did, regardless of some physical changes in his body, because he was the sin bearer, remember? The wrath of God was on his body, and it took its toll upon his physicality. He was the same Jesus that they knew before. You can no more not know one another than not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's completely human and spiritual to want to, be, to want to reconnoiter with your friends. And this is illustrated in a very tender story of the son of the Reverend Lyman Beecher back in the 19th century who, uh, when uh, a child of three, that is his son, went through the ringer when um, his mother died, a godly mother by the name of Roxana. Roxana was a very good mother as far as we know. She was famous for love and for faithfulness and tenderness, understanding, godliness. She was a proverbial wife, pro proverbial uh, uh, Proverbs 31 wife. But her death confused and devastated her three-year-old boy. So at Roxana's funeral, the minister tried to comfort the family, telling them that Roxana was now with the Lord in heaven. And then after the funeral and the internment, the three-year-old watched the burial of his mother. What happened next was very uh, telling. Three-year-old then used what we'll call toddler math, put two and two together, and one day, the young boy, desperately missing his sweet mother, was found outside the window of his mother's bedroom, digging a hole in the ground. And when his father accosted him, wanting an explanation, the child explained that he had craved his mother. And since the minister said that she was in heaven, and he saw her buried in the ground, that he deduced, digging into the earth, to find her, to go to her. Well, like that little boy, we yearn to be reunited with our loved ones as well. However, there's a, a big difference between this and to think of heaven as the exclusive home of God's people, as if God is an absentee landlord, and that he will not be there, and that Christ will not be there. No, heaven is God's throne. It's where you'll enjoy Christ's everlasting company. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said, for they shall see God. And I suspect that this was lost on our seventh president in the United States, Andrew Jackson, who when he lost his wife, Rachel, probably from a heart attack, he lamented in a very low moment, heaven will be no heaven to me, he said, if Rachel isn't there. Now, from what we know about Rachel, 
She was a godly Presbyterian woman, studied scripture, led in Bible studies, uh, and unlike the recent female presidential candidate, she said this, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to live in that palace in Washington. Now, whoever thinks that heaven won't be heaven if so-and-so isn't there is guilty of the supreme snub. The Puritan uh, Thomas Goodwin stated it well. He said, if I were to go to heaven and find that Christ is not there, I, I would leave immediately, for heaven without Christ to me would be hell. You see, heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. And in heaven you will enjoy his glory. In fact, the Greek word here for behold should be underscored. It describes someone who is transfixed that cannot take his eyes off that particular person. The Greek word for behold uh, is the word theoreo, the noun of which is where we get our, our word theatron, which is, in, which is Greek for theater. The idea here is theatricality. So this word describes a mesmerized, studied viewing, like, for example, if you're in a theater and you're uh, transfixed by a famous actor or actress, like watching uh, uh, the late uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier play Hamlet, for example. It's the opposite of a fleeting glance. In 1 John, Chapter 1, John uses this word. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. There it is. Looked upon or studied and touched with our hands concerning, uh, concerning the word of life. Unhappily, unbelievers have it re reversed. They want God to behold them. And they have no interest in beholding God himself. I have an elder friend in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church who's from Argentina. And he tells me that uh, the common people in Buenos Aires have a saying about lightning storms. Maybe you've heard this before. I don't know if you have. But it's said there is so, so great is the, uh, the difference between the poor and the rich that when lightning flashes across the skies in Buenos Aires and the rich people come out to take a look, the saying is that the rich think that God is now using a flash camera to picture them. You see, for them, heaven is a studio where God studies them. A more apropos illustration is the Calvinist Arminian split in the 18th century between Whitfield and John Wesley over the doctrine of election? Well, there was a woman gingerly walked up to Whitfield and asked, Mr. Whitfield, do you think that we shall see Mr. Wesley in heaven? And Whitfield looked at her and said something startling at the very beginning. He said, No, I do not. John Wesley was so bright a star in the firmament of God's glory and will we'll we'll stand so near the throne that one like me, who am less than the least, will never catch a glimpse of him. You see, that story underscores Whitfield's charity and as well as Wesley's nearness to Christ. Our views of, of glory are often too man-centered. For example, it's, it's not uncommon to hear that our departed ones are looking down on us. Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, not even Moses and Elijah look down upon us. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they looked at Christ, just as the disciples did, at least for a time. If anything, they looked up at Jesus. A few years ago, when Frank Sinatra died, Nancy Reagan said that he was now singing in the choir of the angels. You see, her focus wasn't Christ, it was angels. And of course, she glossed over the exceeding sinfulness of Frank Sinatra. Sinners try to upstage Christ however they can. 
In Israel, in fact, Abraham was such a star that the Jews began to pray to him, just like the, uh, the, the Mariola tree in the Roman Catholic Church. But this beholding that we have here in this text isn't a, is not a casual glance or a quick look. It is a studied gaze of adoration and of worship. It is not a breezy Kodak moment. Jesus prays that you will behold his glory, and you will. And the glory, of course, that you are to behold is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, your sovereign creator and your sovereign redeemer. Now, most importantly, of course, we know that we get to heaven only by trusting in Christ crucified for our sins. And we have no right to apply or to misapply John chapter 17, verse 24 to ourselves unless we have committed ourselves to Christ, if we have renounced our own sins and come to him and placed all of our confidence in his one sacrifice on the cross. And when that happens, then you will begin to experience his glory right now through the reading of the scriptures. You see, the New Testament was written by men whose eyes got a foretaste of heaven on earth. But in heaven itself, you'll enjoy, enjoy the full splendor of your Savior. Jesus wants you to behold his incarnate glory. I said just a little bit ago, it is, heaven is a room with a view. And now you know what the view is. Now, God wants you to enjoy his glory now. You'll never enjoy his future glory unless you begin to enjoy it now. And you do this by studying the Christ of the scriptures. The whole Bible about, is about Jesus. There's an old saying. The saying is this, open the Bible anywhere and it bleeds. Because the whole scripture you see is about Christ crucified. And understand that Jesus is, is more your spouse than Rachel was to President Jackson as good a wife as she was, and more your husband than Andrew Jackson was to Rachel. Now, are the three applications that I want to bring before you about Jesus' glory. First, Christ's glory is an absorbing, electrifying glory. And yet there's many who think of, of, of Christ as boring, as a celestial killjoy, well, if God is the supreme enjoyment of a Christian, then it's the unbelievers who are boring. God isn't boring. Neither is, is life, especially in the intermediate heaven which is to come. Consider the music of heaven for starters. Heaven's is, heaven is full of the, at, uh, the atmosphere of joy. There are musical instruments there. And can the same God who gifted men like Beethoven and Bach and Dvorak, for example, be boring? Plus, God also sings. He's the singing God, just as Christ is the singing Savior. When we get to heaven, <clears throat> we'll be astonished by God's singing. God is anything but an old scratchy 78 record you probably have ditched long ago. Also, Christ's glory is an assimilating glory. One day you'll be changed into the same image from glory to glory. It's, an assimilating, it's assimilating because you'll not only see Christ's glory, but you will share in the same glory. Paul wrote about it in Romans 8. For I consider that the, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us, not just around us, but in us. Christ's glory will shine in you, particularly at the, in the resurrection of your body when he returns. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said, glory will not only be present, but within. We shall shine by his beams. And John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, 
Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But you'll see Christ more clearly, more heartily, and emotionally than you'll ever see anyone else. It'll be high definition, to use a modern term. The biggest problem, if there is a problem, isn't whether people will recognize us, but whether we'll recognize ourselves because of the great changes that will take place in our bodies and in our souls at that time. It will be extraordinarily marvelous as to what's going to happen to us in the future. Also, Christ's glory will be an active glory. It's important to grasp that, your, uh, that your, your view won't be like a museum uh, viewing, like going into the Smithsonian, for example, and you're looking at something old, as if Christ is showcased behind glass, like in the Smithsonian. No, in heaven, Christ displays his glory by doing things, by revealing his glory, just as he conversed with Moses and with Elijah on the mount. You see, heaven is a place where you will serve the Lord forever. Emphasis on the word serve. Evangelist Dwight Moody assured his contemporaries before his death. He said, soon you will read in the newspaper that I am dead. Don't believe it. I shall be more alive than ever before. And I remind you that death isn't the passing out of the land of the living into the land of the dying, but it is passing out of the land of the dying into the land of the living, the living. Well, his desire is for your glorification, and this rests upon God's love. Notice, to behold my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Foundation is the Father's love for his Son. Now this may sound strange. You might have thought that Jesus would say because you love them before the foundation. But he says you loved me before the foundation. When Jesus says that his father loved him before the foundation, that includes you because you are in Christ, united to him, you see. God chose you, remember, in Christ. John Calvin beautifully describes it this way. With such a love did the Father embrace him before the creation of the world that he might be the one in whom the Father would love his elect. So here's the thrust. Christ determined that he would go to hell in your behalf rather than live in heaven without you. If that's not love, nothing is. And this is absolutely certain to happen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Christ's prayer for you cannot be and will not be defeated. So what this means is that your death, when it does come, will not be impersonal. Don't treat death as an automatic or as a joyless fate to which we passively have to accommodate ourselves, or bad karma, as some people call it. Mark Twain called death the inevitable event. That's the best he could do. Your death is not random. It will not be because of chance. You're not cut down by blind chance. Don't fatalistically say death to death and ashes to ashes as if death is as natural as drinking water. You were not made to die. You were made to live. And when you were born again by the Spirit of God, you were made to live with Jesus forevermore. One of the uh, New England Puritans, Thomas Shepard, said that in the, on all the other gospel ordinances that we have, like Lord's Supper and especially baptism, Christ comes, he says, on occasion to us. 
But in a believer's death, Christ takes us to be forever with him. Death means for us that Christ takes us to be with him all the time, not occasionally. So in this prayer here in John chapter 17, we have to focus in on this one great truth, and that is this. Death for us is an answer to prayer. Christ's prayers, Christ prays. It's right here in black and white. You may pray for life, and you need to pray for life because there's good things, productive things that we have to do before the Lord takes us. But when death does come, it's Christ's prayer trumping our prayers. So you see, your departure will be an answer to prayer. He prays for your company. He prays that you might see his glory. Heaven, remember, is a room with a view. So what's the final application? It's this. Glorification inspires us to press forward with vigor and with hope and with expectation. Can there be a more powerful motive to serve your God, especially if your flag today is at half mast and you're playing taps for yourself and in despondency, despair? As a hymn writer said, eternal glory gleams afar to nerve my faint endeavor and so now to watch, to work, to war and then to rest forever. Congregation, keep running the race. Run the race of the Christian life with endurance because the finish line is glory. Amen. Let us pray.